the world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and marketplace. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, your family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode and spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. We've got three shows, Cashflow Ninja, Cashflow Investing Secrets, and Recent Investing Secrets. We have a newsletter, the best Cashflow Ninja's newsletter, in which we share every single month one brand new, well-researched Cashflow niche. You can also join our mastermind, Cashflow Nirvana, which was built for business owners and investors that's looking to protect and build wealth during turbulent times. All of this is at CashflowNinja.com. I've got a fantastic show for you today. I'm joined by Aubrey Janik, uh, and Aubrey has built a very successful uh, Turo car rental business, and she is going to share more about this incredible way to generate cash flow. Aubrey, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've been uh, looking forward to this conversation. Um, very excited to learn more about the world of the Turo car rental business, uh, which uh, you've put out a bunch of great content just around that. But b before we jump into cash flow and to the Turo car business, can you please share a little bit about your background uh, and your history and, and what you're up to? Absolutely. So I... Um... So I've been a car sharing host since 2017. I started car sharing really as a side hustle. Like I think most people start doing it. I'd actually owned a, a sandwich shop that I opened years prior. I started dabbling in car sharing like while I owned the sandwich shop and then the sandwich shop ended up closing. And I was sort of left in this position where I'm like, okay, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Like I didn't go to, well, I did go to college, but I dropped out of college. I've always been very entrepreneurial. I really, I think kind of for the first time in my life, didn't have a game plan of what I wanted to do moving forward. It's like, it, it was, I feel like my entire life, I always had this like plan of like, okay, I'm gonna do this by this age, this by this age, so on and so forth. And I was kind of left in this scenario where I'm like, what the heck am I going to do? And so I really started leaning into side hustles and I, I love side hustles. I'm a big believer in side hustles. And so around 2018 is whenever I, I started taking Turo more seriously. It's whenever it became from being this thing that I can just do on the side to like, okay, I'm actually going to try to scale this up. And around that time I was working as a freelancer. I had a, a consulting job that I was working as well that I still have today. And then I started growing my, my car sharing fleet. And, you know, over the years, the, the car sharing fleet has grown. I started doing YouTube for, for fun. It was something I always wanted to do. And I told myself back in 2020, okay, I'm going to do YouTube. I'm going to try it for a year, see if I can get to a thousand subscribers. And if I don't, I'm going to quit. And if I do, I'm going to keep going. And I ended up getting, I think to like maybe 50 or 60,000 subscribers that year. So I kept going and really, you know, over the last couple of years since starting YouTube, it's kind of propelled everything else. It's allowed for me to create courses. I've grown my fleet. I, my husband had quit his job in 2021 to work for our business full time. So he's my business partner and colleague. And yeah, so now as I sit here today, I, I have a number of different income streams, Turo being definitely the biggest and certainly the one that I talk about the most. And it's been this really incredible journey. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, it, you're just a perfect example of you never know where life's going to take you. You know, I guess what for me that I could resonate with you once the point, because I was very regimented and planned too. when you mm -hmm. said like, oh, by this age, I'm going to do this. By this age, I'm going to do that. I kind of had a similar mindset. And it was it wasn't until 
all the plans were kind of thrown out the window that really amazing things started to happen, right? I guess, you know, life is a different uh, loss, right? Or the loss yeah. that you, when you, when you, when you're make when you're making plans. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about uh, Turo um, and the car b- business rental model. So for mm-hmm. folks that have never heard about this, uh, if you can explain kind of just how that works and then why, uh, well, wh- how did you get attracted to this? Why why did you like it? And then why do other people uh, get interested in this in this business and in this business model? Absolutely. So, car sharing for anybody who doesn't know what it is, I always compare it to like an Airbnb for cars. It's where you own a a car, you have a car, and you're renting it out to your peers or loaning it out to your peers, or I guess sharing would be the, the technical term, sharing it out to your peers and exchange for money. It's it's very, very similar to like the concept of Airbnb with property. And so you list your car on Turo, there are requirements like which car you can rent, like what the mileage has to be the year and so on. But you rent your car or you list your car out, people find it, they rent it and you get money. <clears throat> and so I found Turo back in, I, I, I heard of it in 2017. And it was actually a friend of mine who I was doing some work for me at the time with me at the time. And he had purchased a pretty expensive Mercedes. And he was like, I would have never bought this Mercedes, but I'm going to rent it out on Turo to offset the cost. And at that time I had heard of Turo, like I had seen it on ads on social media, but truthfully, I thought it was a scam. And so this was the first person that I had known that was actually doing this and it was supposedly working. And at the time I had a a Jeep Wrangler, it was either 2010 or 2011. I can't remember what year, but it was a um, two-door Jeep Wrangler. I'd purchased that like a year prior. It was sort of my first adult purchase. And other than like my business at the time, it was like my first adult car purchase. And I hated it. I did not like it. I, my dogs hated the car. I didn't really drive it. Instead, I drove my 1997 Forerunner, which is still my daily driver today. And so after I had heard of my friend doing this with the Mercedes, I was like, you know, I'm going to put my Jeep on this. And so like that night I did very little research. I put my Jeep on Turo and it was rented out within 24 hours. And really after that, it was, okay, this is really cool. This is really interesting. I'm going to stick to that. And within a few months, we ended up getting a second car and then kind of slowly scaled the fleet from there. And I was really attracted to it because it just made sense. Like something about it just clicked with me from the beginning. I've always liked cars. I've grown out of it a little bit as I've gotten older, but at that phase in my life, I was pretty into cars. I liked them. I was even more into business. My husband, who was at the time, my boyfriend, he's a big car guy. And so it just was like worlds were colliding and it was like the perfect, really the perfect situation and side hustle for my life at the time. So just as Airbnb disrupted the hospitality industry uh, and hotels, Turo is doing that in the car renting kind of space. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of similarities, but that you could see, but I mean, you're, you're renting this from other people and for a specific period and, and then obviously returning it the same as the home. So um, it's a little bit more of a personal touch and feel. What are some of the other things that you found that people prefer Turo over uh, renting, you know, let's just say just from a regular car rental company? A great question. So I think that with Turo, there's a few different approaches that you can have. And and my approach is one that I've been pretty outspoken about, which is this like low end economy model. And so like, if you look on Turo, they'll really advertise the platform as being like, own the adventure. That's their tagline. And so it's like this idea of you're renting an experience, not just a car. And while that is, I think, a very valid business model to go with with Turo is like buying those cool cars that people want to rent because they're unique. There's also, of course, that segment of renters that are going to Turo because it's either more convenient, they just like supporting local entrepreneurs rather than companies, or maybe because there's a car on Turo that they couldn't rent with a rental car company, for example, maybe a specific convertible or a seven row or a seven seater SUV. But for me, my target audience are local renters who are on a budget. And so a lot of my renters don't qualify for traditional rental car companies. I also get a ton of renters that are picking up at really strange hours. Like we get a lot of business like before 6 a.m., a lot of business after 10 p.m. And so it's really catering to that person that for whatever reason, that traditional rental car company just doesn't work for them. This is a very, a very important business lesson you just shared too. And I just wanted to um, 
reiterate that um, it's so important to know who you are serving and who you are providing a service or a product for. So as you mentioned, you know exactly yeah. who the people are that's renting uh, your cars on Turo. And uh, just with like any business, uh, it, there's a Nordstrom level, there's a Target level, and there's kind of a Walmart level, and you need to understand, and there's different needs. I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. There's a friend of mine, and actually my brother-in-law has done this a couple of times too, they want to uh, rent sp very exclusive cars that's on Turo, that you're not going to find those cars yeah. um, through rental companies. So there's a white glove service element to that too. So in that, you know, at where they're at and the exactly the the, the cars that they're that they're renting, uh, the owners of those cars will even meet them at airports. They would drive okay. to airports. They would hand the cars off. I mean, it's white glove. Yes. Um, you know, just with those three examples that I shared, you know, the Nordstrom, the uh, the Target and the Walmart, they all shall sell shirts. They sell shirts to different people. Everybody buys a shirt from each of those stores for very different reasons. And they all make money selling shirts. Same thing in the in the, the car rental space and, and in the Turo space. So you need to under you need to know exactly who the person is that's going to rent that from you. And then you're going to understand what they need and why they are choosing to rent from Turo instead of just a, a just a regular rental company, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Absolutely agree with you. And, and, you know, we get, um, and I post a lot of posts on social media between YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and there is like this element of, you know, if you're posting on social media, you want people to, to, to click and have a conversation. And one of our, our, like, a great way for us to get views on TikTok is to showcase some of our just older, more kind of rundown cars. It's like things like Toyota Yaris is that are maybe a 2011. They're great condition, but they do have a little bit worn out paint. They're not perfect. They're not what you would receive at an Enterprise or a Hertz. And I get asked so often, who is going to rent this car? Like who's going to rent it? And the question is people that can't afford a regular rental car, people that need a long-term rental and they don't want to pay multi thousands of dollars for it, or people that just can't qualify. And for those types of people, you know, a 2011 Toyota Yaris or a 2012 Mazda, those are perfect. And so we have found that a lot of our renters do not qualify for other rental companies. We found a lot of people who just don't want to pay for a newer car. They just don't really care. And yep. it's, it's really these local renters that are, are local to our area. They need a car for whatever reason. And we have that for them. I want to take a moment to share something very important right now. Are you trying to figure out how to protect your savings from the banking collapse, which has already started, and the coming financial crisis. Most banks will fail. Deposits that are not insured by the FDIC will be lost, and there will be bank bail-ins. And this collapse in the banking system will lead to chaos in the financial system. Banks also provide loans to real estate investors. So what do you think? is going to happen to lending in the event of a banking and a financial crisis. You can be proactive and position your savings to protect it and also have access to it to use it to buy discounted assets by positioning it in your own banking system through the infinite banking concept strategy. Producers Wealth has put together a presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com where you will learn how to position capital outside of the banking system and the Wall, Wall Street casino, just like the ultra-wealthy, to protect it and create a pool of tax-free liquid capital to capitalize on the massive opportunity to buy discounted assets, which is coming. You can access the presentation at your own banking system.com. That's your own banking system.com. Another thing that I would also add, um, and this is what this person told me that that rents on Turo too, is the there's less red tape. Yeah. So kind of like Airbnb too, where everything is before you even get to your de end destination. I mean, with Airbnb, by the time you get to your end destination, they give you a code and you go in. Mm -hmm. That's it. There's no hoopla or red tape or waiting and do they even have the car you know yeah. grabbing a Seinfeld joke 
about you took the reservation, you didn't <laughs> hold the reservation when they were out of a rental car, right? Um, so yeah, so there's less red tape with this as, with this as well. So very, very easy, user-friendly, which is huge, especially for busy people. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And and that experience is going to be quite a bit different depending on who you're renting from. Like to your point, there are a lot of hosts that do give that white glove experience, even on like not super exclusive cars. Like there are hosts that will deliver every single car to the airport. They'll meet every single guest in person. For me, I am not interested in doing that in the slightest. I very, very rarely, if ever, meet guests in person. And what we do is we instead do the remote key exchange like process, which is where we basically have the key at a, in a lockbox. The guests access the lockbox, similar to what you do like in an Airbnb and prior to their rental, they get the code. And so whenever they come to pick up the car, we we rent a lot that's, that's relatively close to where we live. And like, we will sometimes see people like literally get out of their Uber, jump into their car and that they've rented from us. And within three minutes, they're off. No communication with other people, no rental car counter, no waits. They know the car is there. And it's just, it's very fast. It's very efficient. And it, it's a really, I think, great way of doing things. But, you know, you do also occasionally come across those hosts that just aren't good at being a host either, where a guest will go to the car and the car is unavailable. It's been canceled. So you do have those red tape and kind of those horror stories with Turo. But I I think that efficient Turo hosts are more efficient than like Hertz and Enterprise and those larger comp- companies. It's just a great alternative. Yeah. And um, to bring in that example, again, of different expectations, different clients, different cars, it's if you think about another ride share, Uber, it's your regular Uber, You what's it, Uber XL and your Uber Black. So there's different different kind of things that associate with that because there's different expectations. For sure. um, what are some of the business models that you can share around this and just uh, a simplified one and the different types of tour businesses that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. So The first one is the one that I practice, which is the low-end economy model. So this idea is buying cars that are priced anywhere between five and $7,000. And you buy these cash. I I buy all of my cars in cash. I have 27 cars in my fleet. None of them have loans. They're all owned outright. And that's something I talk about a lot. But newer people, like sometimes it's unrealistic to pay $7,000 cash for a car. So a lot of people will finance their first few. But the idea is buying these cars that are going to get their return on investment super fast. Like with my course and with my YouTube channel, I teach people how to buy cars that are going to return 100% of the cost of that vehicle within about six months. And sometimes I've had cars that have returned their cost within three, sometimes it's seven. Whereas if you buy a car that is, you know, 30 or 40 grand, kind of that stereotypical rental car, it's going to take three years to return that investment. So that's kind of one business model. You then of course have, I think kind of the normal standard business model that you think of with Turo, which is the more normal everyday cars, things like 2018, 19, 20, maybe 21, 22 model cars. They're the cars that you you really stereotypically think of whenever rental cars are brought into the equation. I do not love this business model because I just think the profit isn't It's just not as enticing to me. And maybe that's because I've been doing my business model for so long that I've become spoiled with the return. Um, But that's what a lot of people do. And they use the argument of, and there's some validity, I think, to these arguments is more reliable, just more broader market. Um, You're targeting the tourist. You're making more on a daily rate. So that's some of those, those arguments for that business model. There's also an entire industry of like co-hosting. And I actually just started working with a host, um, out of Florida who has a hundred and I think he's up to 160, maybe 165 cars. Oh, wow. And he, uh, he does co-hosting. So almost all of his cars are ones that are owned by other people. They, they send them over to him similar to like an investor model of, of, you know, these are investors within his company. They buy cars, they send them to him, he manages them and then they get paid out monthly. And for that one, that's one of the ones that I think have gained a lot of steam online just because it's a very attractive model for people that don't have money to buy their own cars is, Hey, I'm going to get these people to send me cars instead. And while I think it can be a really good model, it's also one that can be very bad. It's kind of like, you know, the amateurs hiding amongst the experts in this field. And there are a few people that I think are really, really great at doing co-hosting. There are a few people, there are many people that I think are very, very bad at it. So if anybody who's like watching this video is interested in, being an investor in this situation and actually sending their car to a host, I would definitely do your due diligence on who you're sending it to. But then it's also a really great way to get started with Turo in a pretty low cost way. And I would view co-hosting as a great method 
to get to the point where you can just buy all of your own cars. It's like maybe you buy your first car, maybe you co-host the next few, maybe you buy the next one and you kind of rinse and repeat until you're able to afford all of your own vehicles. But that's sort of the that's sort of the business models that I would say are the most popular is the loan economy, co-hosting, and then just kind of your standard Turo rental car operation. Right. And then obviously the high-end luxury kind of cars, vintage collectors kind of cars too. Yeah, and and that's definitely a segment of Turo. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's a business model within Turo just because I think it's an unsustainable one. Is you see a lot of hosts that have maybe an exotic car or a high end luxury car within their and, and there are I, I guess a good amount of fleet owners that have exclusively high end luxury cars. But I think for people first starting out, it's a dangerous game to play because it's just so high cost. And whenever it comes to classics, there are a lot of hosts that have like a couple of classic cars mixed into their vehicle fleet. But I don't know that I would build out a fleet of classic cars, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, th there's just so many similar uh, similarities with the Airbnb kind yeah. of business model, too, because we uh, had someone on the show years ago that he was you shared the co-hosting model where they would go to property owners yeah, and they would say, okay, it's just sitting there vacant. I can do, you know, I could take this over and short, short, do a short-term rental model for yeah, you. Like the Airbnb arbitrage model. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's so many similarities. Um, what are some of the costs and overheads that business owners typically have in these uh, different models and what people should be aware of? Um, when they're when they're considering this this business model for sure so there are i mean obviously the car is one but like we'll kind of keep that out because it just depends on you know what is the car that you're buying how much is it going to cost what's the interest rate did you pay it in cash so that's obviously the biggest is the vehicle um in addition to like just the cost of the car you have uh trackers is something that a lot of people get i encourage people to get them our tracker can cost anywhere between maybe $75 to $150 for the actual device. And then the online, like the monthly fee to keep that going can be anywhere between $7 to $20 per month, depending on the type of tracker you have. Mostly it's around that $10 mark, but there are some high-end ones. You have insurance, which insurance is going to be very dependent on the type of cars you have. And so for my cars, because they're so cheap and because we do a lot of our maintenance in-house, we have just liability on our cars. So we do not have like the comprehensive comprehensive where if we get in an accident and we caused it, our car will not be covered. It will just cover the person we hit. And so for that, our cars are about $50 per month, but it can be as high as like 70, 80, $90 per month, depending on the car. And whenever it comes to insurance, there's like Turo specific insurance policies. You can get a commercial policy. Some people will just do it on their personal and hope and cross their fingers that their insurance company doesn't find out. That's obviously not really the proper way to go about doing it. Then you have uh, maintenance. I mean, maintenance is definitely one of the biggest costs for sure. And it's one of those things that can fluctuate a lot month by month. Like for example, the month of August was a very maintenance heavy month for us. And the summer in general was tough because Texas was incredibly hot and it really took a toll on our AC systems in our cars. And so, you know, on a bad month, we'll spend a lot of money, like thousands of dollars in repairs. Whereas on a good month, we might spend a few hundred. But maintenance is going to be a big one that could be oil changes, tires, brakes, the standard, but then it's also repairs. And so one of the things about car sharing, and it's really with anything where you're loaning people your things, is that people are never going to take care of your things as well as you're going to take care of them. And so car sharing vehicles get worn out much faster. They just get a lot more wear and tear. There's a lot more repairs that have to be done. And because they're driven so consistently, all of the maintenance has to be done much faster. And so there's that aspect of the equation as well. Um, and then there's the reimbursable expenses and overhead as well. For example, like toll charges, gas, things like that. And then we actually work. So the way that we have our operation is we rent a commercial lot, which is pretty close to where we live. We pay $200 per month for that lot, which is a, is a steal. That price would depend on where you live. And we do all of the work out of our home garage. And so we're trying to get to about 35 cars before we end up renting a commercial space. So our rent is free. But obviously, if if you like wanted to rent out a commercial space, it would be more expensive. And then how does the uh, fees with the app work off Turo? Because obviously, when you book through the Airbnb app, there's Airbnb, obviously, fees involved with that. And For it's sure. the same. Yeah, there's the same thing with any app. So how does that work? So there's kind of two aspects of that equation is so whenever you're a Turo host, you choose a protection package. 
And your protection package is the insurance, and they say it's not insurance, it's the protection that you're going to receive if your car is in an accident. And so they have multiple tiers. It's the 60-40 tier, the I think it's 75, 25, 80, 20, and the 90, 10. And the deduct, the difference between those tiers from a host perspective is the amount of coverage that you get and how much of a deductible you have to pay. And so for example, the 90, 10 rule you'll take, or the 90, 10 package, you'll keep 90% of the earnings. Turo will keep 10, but you have to pay a $2,500 deductible if your car gets damaged in order to get coverage. So Turo is not gonna step in for any damage claim unless it exceeds 2,500. Um, for me, I'm on the 80, 20 plan. So they keep 20% of everything I earn. And then my deductible is $750. So they'll cover any damage above that. But then there's also like Turo fees in addition to that. So they apply like a young driver fee. They have various fees depending on, I don't know exactly what's taken into account, but I'm pretty sure it's based on things like credit score, driving history, things like that. And so if you're a higher risk driver, you're going to have to pay a higher fee. And those fees are not like, I don't get any of that fee that all goes to Turo. So they kind of have two sources of income, the Turo fee and then the protection package commission. So they are doing due diligence on drivers on behalf of these business owners on the front end too, because yeah. you have to, obviously, when you create a profile, put your name in, driver's license and so forth. So they can pull all these things up if you have a terrible driving record, if you're yeah. a young driver, that kind, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not sure what exactly goes into it, like what their threshold is, because I've had some pretty bad drivers rent my cars. So I don't know how detailed it is and, and what how exactly that works. I do know that their young driver fee can be pretty significant because I've had like neighbors who reached out to me and said, hey, can can my 21 year old son rent your car? And then it comes out to like $100 per day to rent a 10 year old car. And so that fee I know is one that's significant. I'm not sure what other like what other factors go into it, but there's definitely a due diligence process. Gotcha. And then um, from a business owner standpoint, there's obviously a lot of benefits. So you're getting the income uh, mm -hmm. that you generate by renting your vehicle on the app Turo. Um, and then also because it's car, if you're, if you're doing this as a business, there's obviously tax benefits mm -hmm. that's involved through depreciation because this is now a vehicle which is being operated in within your business, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that I like, I, I hear all, especially whenever anybody who's a Turo host makes a video or a post on social media saying, here's how much I made. That one of the comments that people always say is, well, what was it after taxes? The tax benefits with Turo are insane. Like it's, it's, it, I think it's comparable to real estate in a way. Obviously it doesn't yep. have the long-term benefits of real estate, but it has the, I think more impactful short-term benefits to Turo. And I mean, to real estate. And not only do you have the ability to deduct expenses, deduct, you know, the ongoing um, cost, maintenance, repairs, things like that, but the depreciation of the cars is huge. And you, you can get to the point, especially if you're a host that's buying a lot of cars per year, where you basically decide, okay, how much do I want to pay in taxes this year? It's like, for example, my husband and I, we're looking to buy, like we're pre-planning for the purchase of our of a new house for our personal use in probably five years. And so there's been this strategic conversation of like, okay, how much needs to be reflected on our tax returns to make us be able to, to get approved for this? And so there is like that ability of like, you have a lot of control and your finances, how much you're going to owe at the end of the tax year. There's just, I mean, there's a ton of benefits. Even if I because I have so many different income streams that even if I didn't want to do Turo, even if I had no use for it anymore, I would continue doing it purely because of a tax perspective. Obviously, that isn't the case. I like Turo and I make good money from it, but the tax benefits are huge. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Penumbra Solutions. Life settlements investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion-dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. If you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments, Penumbra Solutions, at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. That's cashflowninja.com forward slash 
live settlements. The password to access that webinar is Penumbra, all lowercase. We have a, a, a filter which we use within, within our community um, to evaluate deals. And you look at the cash flow, which is great. And obviously you can keep growing that with more cars. The, the tax benefits is the second part, which this is great. As you mentioned, you have full, you have control over your taxes because this is now goods that you're incorporating in your business, providing more value to the marketplace, making more money, and therefore you pay less taxes. That's what I love about the tax code in the United States and all over the world. Um, and then uh, the the third the third piece is appreciation. Now, obviously, when you have cars and you rent it out, the co- the value of the cars are are going to go down, but the business itself. Um, eventually could be something that's sellable, right? If you're going in it as a professional and doing it as a business because you're you're evaluating the business based on the net operating income. So you, I yeah. could see appreciation there. And then the leverage is the fourth piece. If you can leverage the skill set, capabilities, networks, and even capital of, of, of other people, OPM, uh, there's a ton year where you have an app that you can leverage and of course, technology and yeah, is it true? Is it completely passive? No, but you could set it up that it's semi-passive, right? With a lot of technology that you can leverage in place, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I agree with everything that you've said. And as far as like the passivity aspect of the equation, I I love the term semi-passive. I think that it's a perfect descriptor of Turo. Is like whenever you look at at Uber and Lyft and all and these types of like kind of cookie cutter side hustles that people can start tomorrow, the huge downside of them is that you only are making money when you work. And so if you're not clocked in, you're not making money. End of story. And obviously with a job, there's that you know, aspect of the job where depending on how you you're paid, I guess it could be considered similar. Whereas if you're off, you're not making money, or maybe you would be if you're making salary, but with Turo, it's great because your work isn't directly correlated to how much you're going to make. I mean, there are some days where we have a lot of cars coming back, a lot going out and it's a busy, busy day. Um, but there are other days where we have nothing coming back either because, you know, trip cars are on on extended rentals or just not coming back that day. We might have a day where we do 45 minutes of work, and we're still making the same amount that day. And I think that in the world of side hustles, that's just so rare for somebody to be able to have that type of income, even on a small scale, if you just have one car, having the ability to make this semi-passive income, I think is hard to come by in Turo, I think is a perfect option for that. And then there are, of course, ways to make it more passive. I mean, if you are if you're having, if you're meeting every guest in person, delivering to the airports, having that white glove treatment, I think your ability to scale is going to hit a ceiling at some point because there's only yep. so much time in the day. But the way that we've set up our, our business with automated messaging, lock boxes, having our GPSs enabled to let us know when cars return and when they, they leave, having everything built out the way that we've done it has made it so that we are able to have a very normal, my, my husband works for our fleet, what I would consider to be full time. I'm at this point. I've stepped away from the day-to-day quite a bit, so I'm not as involved, but we run our our 27 car fleet, I would say on a one person's work week, like 40 hours a week for one person, it's spread across the both of us. And then we have the ability to travel, to take weekends off, to take days off if we need to. And it's just, it's it's created this really great way to semi-passively make money. It does require work, it's not easy, but it's definitely scalable and it's doable. Yeah, absolutely. any comments on strategic location of your business and where you're locate, located at? Because I can already think of, you know, if I have to think about questions that are people listening to our conversation with us, that would be one. You're in Dallas, Fort Worth, right? That market. Yeah. There are other people in different, bigger markets. Uh, any comments on where you're located and a strategic location uh, to take into consideration with a Turo business? Yeah, great question. So, When it comes to location, I think that there are a lot of different beliefs to this. So I do not offer delivery. I never have. I don't meet my guests in person. And I'm 45 minutes away from the closest airport. So this works. Some guests do come from the airport, but the majority of them are local renters. And I'm also about 30 30 to 40 minutes away from downtown Dallas. And so I'm not quite in Dallas. I'm in a suburb. And 
we have made it work really well because of our just 24 seven availability. And so what I always tell people is, and whenever I say, I just, cause I know that this is a topic a lot of people ask me is that whenever I say that we are available 24 seven, it does not mean that I am checking in cars at 2 AM. It means that my cars are available to be pre rented out 24 seven virtually. Um, but I still have that like nine to five work week. Like we pretty much stop working at six. We're not working until 1 a.m., 2 a.m. We're not meeting guests at, at midnight. So that's the caveat to that 24 seven availability. But so often I hear people say, well, where should I put my cars? Should I go to the airport? Should I go to the city center? Like, how does that look like? And while I think it does matter, I think that more important than your location is going to be ranking in the Turo algorithm. Like Turo is going to be your best promoter and things like delivery do matter. Like they're a metric, but it's not the end all be all to success. So like things like your location delivery, those are important, but not the end all be all things that are, I think more important is making sure that your your cars are very available, making sure that you have instant booking turned on, which basically means that anybody can rent your car. You don't like, you're not able to view their profile before they book having your advance notice turned on to the minimum, which means that guests can book their car, your car with only a one hour advance notice and having things like trip buffer time, the minimum as well, which is three hours. So that means if a trip ended at 1 PM, another guest could book it at four. And that's kind of the minimum that Turo allows. And so I find so often whenever people, you know, they have trouble with Turo, it's not because they're not in a good location. It's because their car is available for four hours a day. And so I would say like, that's priority number one. And then priority number two for, and and then, so that's priority number one. And then whenever it comes to location, I'm a big believer in making it convenient for yourself. If you have your cars 45 minutes away from you, it's going to be impossible to make your cars available 24 seven because you're going to drive yourself mad in the process of doing that. And so I've created my Turo business really around the convenience aspect of how can I keep my cars available for as long as possible without going crazy at the same time. And while also maintaining a life and maintaining these other businesses that I have. And so for us, that was the priority of, okay, we want our cars to be within a three minute drive of where we live. We'd probably go, I think the furthest we would go out was maybe it would be five minutes. Um, So that was a priority for us. But sometimes, you know, for some people, depending on their town, maybe they have to go a little bit further out. If somebody lives close to an airport, I think an airport will no doubt increase your business, um, especially if you're like five to 10 minutes from an airport. There's also really great ways to use things like airports by, you know, having an Uber system in place where you actually get Ubers for the guests. There's a lot of hosts that will rent parking lots next to airports and offer some sort of shuttle service. So there's a lot of ways to create your location to just get as much business as possible. The airport is going to be really conducive to that. But because I'm so far from the airport and I'm not interested in in going to an office, renting out a commercial space or having to drive 30 minutes to get to and from the airport, for me, my convenience and being able to create an environment where I could have my cars available as often as possible was priority number one. So not to get too far in the weeds here, but I'm just curious so do the people that rent the car, they fill it up with gas again and yeah. they clean it? So they don't have to clean it. Some do, some don't. And so it's it's pretty rare for a car to get returned to where like it doesn't need anything. It's just like good to go. So we do typically um, like for our dark cars that are like black or, or just show dirt very easily. We have a car wash pass for those. So we'll go and take them to the wash between each and every rental. For our lighter colored cars, they don't show dirt quite as badly. And so we might not wash them at the car wash, but we will disinfect them, wipe down the steering wheel. Turo had a pretty intense COVID protocol during the pandemic where you had to like pretty heavily disinfect the cars. That has gone away, but it's still, you know, good practice to disinfect it. So we'll wipe down the cars, vacuum it, clean the windows. And it probably takes, if if it's just a normal amount of dirt, 15 minutes to get a car ready. Um, But occasionally cars get returned, like absolutely trashed, at which point it takes like an hour. So you can employ, you can uh, get someone from the outside to take care of all of that, right? So you can hire someone to go to the lot to clean cars and take them through the car wash whenever the yeah. cars are being brought in. You could for sure. I mean, I think that one one thing that I caution new Turo hosts is like getting into the weeds of that too early. So yeah. for us, we started our Turo fleet in 2017. I did all of it on my own until 2021. Um, where at that point we had about 16 cars, maybe 15, 16. So I managed 15, 16 cars by myself. 
And 2021, my husband took over. He managed it by himself with like my involvement a little bit here and there when he needed it until we hit 25 cars. And at 25 cars, we hired a part-time employee. And so I do think that you can very realistically clean your cars, get them ready while also working a job, I think without the help of an employee, like you're going to have to hustle, but I think that that's the best way to do it because then you can store all the cash and then you can use that to scale your fleet. And then that way, whenever you get to 10 cars, you can really, I think, comfortably hire somebody to help you part-time and it's not going to suck cash out of the business quite as much. So how, uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen? I was going to say, how does this go pear shaped What are some of the biggest mistakes uh, that you've seen uh, Turo hosts and Turo businesses make? Hands down. I think the biggest and the most common mistake is buying the wrong cars at the wrong price. So one thing that I talk about all the time on my channel is buying cars below market value and buying them at the bottom of the depreciation curve. So the thought process here, and it, it really works well with my business model of buying older cars, but you can do it with newer cars as well, is the idea here is that you buy cars that have, so like a depreciation curve looks like this. So like the first few years, you're going to have a ton of depreciation. They may drop 30% in value. And then the, the depreciation is going to slow down. And then by the time the car is, is maybe 10 years old, nine years old, the depreciation is much, much slower. And depending on the car, it might be over. And so what we do is we buy cars that are at the bottom of their depreciation curve, but then we also aim to buy that car about 10% below market value. So if, a K, if KBB and just the general value of that car on the market is, let's say, $7,000, we will want to aim to get that car close to $6,000, so maybe $6,200, $6,300. And this makes it so that not only do we have the ability to rent that car out for a good price, but if the car is totaled, if we have to sell the car, we can do so without losing money. Where people run into a ton of problems is whenever they buy a car at MSRP below, I mean, at MSRP above MSRP, which was super common during the pandemic in 2021, whenever car prices were going through the roof yep. or people buy new model cars and they just appreciate like a rock. I get messages all the time from people. It's it's a weekly occurrence of them saying, Hey, I joined Turo. I've been on for a year. I was doing well, but my car was totaled and Turo is only paying me out $10,000, but I actually owe $16,000 on the car loan. Like, what do I do? Or people that have a car that they they bought, it, it's not performing as well as they thought it would for whatever reason, but they now can't sell it because it's worth 20% less than what they owe. And that's something that is so common. It puts hosts in a horrible situation to where they have to rent their car out for a certain price or else they're not making money. It leaves them with no options if they need to sell the car. And it puts them in a horrible predicament whenever their car gets totaled. And so by buying these below market value cars, you have the ability to price your cars at any price because you're going to be fine no matter what. You have the ability to make a profit if your car gets totaled. And if you need to sell a car, it's not an issue. And Whenever people are in the situation where they're severely underwater on cars, it's just a disaster. And it's so, so common. And it's something that I think is very easily avoidable, but it's such a, uh, it's such a big mistake. Yeah. Um, and then for people that are interested in starting a Turo business, what are some of the things that you would uh, advise them? These are the things that you should be thinking about. If you're thinking about starting this as a side hustle and growing it into a business, and there might be people in our audience that just want to start a business in, yeah. in this space right away. So one is I would I would advise going with that below, like buy below market value, buy at the bottom of the depreciation curve. This for many cars is like maybe aim to buy a 2011 to 2013 model car. Um, reliability for your first car is going to be huge. Like you want to buy a car that has a good reputation. For me, that's Hondas, um, I think Mazdas are great. Toyotas can never, never fail a Toyota. Um, reliability is so important because whenever you have your first few cars, a poor car that is performing badly, that's always getting repaired, it's going to drown you. Whereas whenever you start growing, you can kind of afford to have those duds, um, which I've purchased in the past. And so reliability is very important. And then I would also say, you know, start implementing those passive aspects of the business as soon as possible. Like a lot of people, whenever they first get started, say, I'm actually going to meet all of my guests in person whenever I'm first beginning. But I actually advise the opposite. I think, you know, start, start the business as you would continue the business if you were to scale. So I would recommend doing the remote key exchange process, like have a lockbox at your car, get used to that series of events. That way, as you grow, you can do so much more easily. So that's probably the, the top three things that I would say. I want to acknowledge one of our sponsors. 
Are you ready to ride the wave of success in the booming car wash industry? Tommy's Express Car Wash is the cutting edge brand that is revolutionizing the way we clean vehicles. Demand for top-notch, state-of-the-art tunnel car wash is skyrocketing. Institutions are diving in head first, and the real asset investor is already a step ahead. They have a world-class operations team, and they're building a portfolio of Tommy's Express car washes that's on track to become one of the largest privately owned car wash portfolios in the United States. The margins on a stabilized Tommy's Express car wash are incredible, and accredited investors have the chance to join them on their adventure. Dave Zook, the founder and CEO of The Real Asset Investor, and his team are thrilled to share opportunities like Tommy's Car Wash with accredited investors that boost your cash flow, unlocks massive tax benefits, and get you set up for a lucrative exit just a few years from now. To learn more about the opportunities offered by The Real Asset Investor, you can reach out to them at info at therealassetinvestor.com. That's info at therealassetinvestor.com. To your point, if you're starting this up too, you know, here's just kind of my thinking right now, especially at where we're at in the car markets and we're seeing a lot of stuff coming down. As you mentioned, there was a exuberance in the car market. There was a shortage, right? So there was a massive demand for certain cars, not mm -hmm. a lot of supply, prices skyrocket. You had all this money floating around through the currency that was created. So all of a sudden, people had money to spend that drove up the prices a lot. So for folks that are starting it and leveraging and financing cars to for a business like this to scale quickly, they might want to think twice and just have a look at where the economy is at. Um, and then, you know, to your point, um, if you think about it as a business and you have capital to invest in the business, that's great. Uh, go into it under leverage, whether you don't want to be levered to the top with car prices coming down, the economy kind of changing, habits kind of changing and so forth. So there's a lot of things to just think about, you know, from I would say from that perspective. And then I, I, the the response, and I'm already hearing, especially younger listeners saying, well, then how do I get started if I don't have money to get started? You already shared a great idea of this uh, sharing kind of where mm -hmm. you have people that bring you cars and you're the, the the person that's renting them out and running the business. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that you've hit the nail on the head. And I think whenever it comes to financing, that's where I've, I've kind of changed my tune with it over the years. Like whenever I first started my YouTube career, I was adamant about not financing cars. Um, now I've, I've changed because I get it. You know, not everybody has a few thousand dollars to spend on finance on buying a car cash. So whenever it comes to financing, you know, pay attention to the rate, pay off the loan as fast as possible. I understand the idea of like, use other people's money. Don't pay down debt too fast. But if you have a 10, 12% interest rate, which is the, the pretty much the average for used cars right now, pay that down as fast as possible. And also maybe look at credit unions, credit. There are credit, like the credit union that I work with, which is a, a credit union in the Dallas area called RBFCU. Um, um, they not only fund businesses and personal, but they also fund um, fund purchases private party. And that's, I think, if somebody is looking to finance a car, I would go with a lender that finances private party because you're going to find the best deals private party. You're not going to find them at dealerships. Yeah. And this is great, great advice because there's different parts of the market cycle too, economic, mm -hmm. market, that, and so forth. So for example, when rates were basically at zero yeah. and they were giving away financing, that would be a pretty good time to finance it and, and yeah. utilize that, right? But now, as you mentioned, you have double digits interest rates just on secondhand cars. Probably you want to you want to have a strategy in place and and be very uh be very aware of. Yeah, um, for sure. So this has been great. Um, I really appreciate uh, this information around Turo and Turo businesses. Um, and you you are involved in a lot of different things and have a ton of income streams. Uh, I'm always very interested to learn what uh, success on wealthy people are learning and what they're studying. What are you uh, learning and studying these days? So 
I probably am not learning and studying as much as I should be, admittedly. Um, I feel like sometimes I get stuck in my own loop of the work I'm doing that I have a hard time veering out and learning new things. One of the biggest things for me right now has been real estate. So I've kind of been viewing Turo as like, Turo is my cash flow generator. I understand that cars, they're not a long-term investment, even if you buy yep. them at the right price. So we're kind of strategizing our income, like flow of income of, okay, Turo is what's going to raise the capital, but the long-term plan is real estate. So we've been learning a lot about you know, financing real estate, what path to go down, what types of real estate we want to buy. And I would say of like the business things that I'm learning actively right now, that's definitely been one of the big focuses. And then of course, you know, being a YouTuber, I'm always trying to learn new ways to just keep people engaged, create new content. And so I'm, I'm always trying to improve the things that I'm currently working on. But if, as far as new things, real estate would definitely be the biggest. Yeah, great. And like so many very wealthy people and families, they generate their cash their cash flow in businesses and then where do they where do they put it eventually real estate yeah. so um yeah some very very good strategy there now one question that i ask all of our first time guests is we talk a lot about business we talk about cash flow we talk about investing but we also talk about uh, a lot about legacy and principles and values so if you cannot pass on any money to future generations but you were only allowed to pass on three principles to them to uh, achieve happiness and build wealth, what would they be? That's a good question. Um, so I would say one is is like fiscal education, like learn about finances or I guess financial education, not fiscal. Financial education is the biggest. I think learn about finances as early as possible. Um, it's something that I'm teaching my nieces. It's something that I've been just throwing down the throats of everybody I know is basically like learn as much as you can, as fast as you can and start early. So that's the first one is like, be educated, start early. Um, second is, is, you know, work hard is I, I think, I think having a good work ethic is so incredibly important. And I think that it's one of like, it's almost like a muscle is you have to like work at it. You have to keep being consistent is if you fall into bad habits, if you get lazy, if you start getting complacent, it's going to get harder to get back on your feet and just like keep moving forward. So I'm such a big believer of, you know, have your head down and just work at it. And then I would also say, you know, as I'm approaching my thirties is like, don't waste your young years either is, is, you know, it's never too early to start investing into retirement accounts. It's never too early to start saving money. It's never too early to start a business. I think that so many people view, and I think that this is changing here and there, especially with social media, is so many people view their 20s as like the year where they can relax and just kind of go through the motions of going to school, getting their first job, enjoy their life. And while all of that stuff is true, I also have been one of those people that has definitely had the opposite belief of like the 20s are my years to just grind, be super busy, try to do as much as possible, because I understand that as I get older and, you know, as I enter different phases of my life, the the ability to work 12, 13 hour days is going to go away. And so using your 20s as a way to really take advantage of that, I think is important, especially if you're somebody that wants to be, you know, an extremely wealthy, successful person later on. If you don't want that, then I think that's fine. But if you do, the 20s are in invaluable. Absolutely. A great setup here, 20s and 30s, and then you're then you're set up. Yeah. So uh, this has been a blast. Um, Aubrey, where can uh, my listeners and viewers, where can they learn more about you? Uh, by the way, you're you're putting out great courses, obviously great content. You cannot go on any social media and put in Turo with without <laughs> coming across her great content. But you have courses, you have resources, and all that stuff. Where can my listeners and viewers uh, stay in touch and follow you and learn all about uh, Turo businesses? Yeah, for sure. So my course is the Car Sharing Masterclass. You can find it at thecarsharingmasterclass.com. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. I actually have two of them. I have a vlog channel and a regular channel. The regular channel is just my name, Aubrey Janik. So A-U-B-R-E-Y-J-A-N-I-K. My vlog channel is Aubrey and HP. It's one I do with my husband. Um, and it's just kind of going through the day-to-day -day of like how we manage our fleet. And then my Instagram and TikTok is Aubrey.Janik. And it's more of the same type of content. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us and coming on the show and sharing your knowledge and your insights and just providing so much value for all of my listeners and viewers. Of course. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. Thank you to our listeners and viewers for spending your most valuable resource or time once again uh, with me on the Cashflow Ninja. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. CashflowNinja.com. 
Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.